so uh number 14 yes this is number this is number 14 yes and are you familiar with the significance of that number what it all means seven is lucky and twi- two sevens is double lucky 14 is the percentage of republican men who were they to read george orwell's 1984 would say hey we don't want to do that I thought it was the percentage of Americans who believed in QAnon. Wasn't that 14 percent? No, that's no. that's the inverse. That's 86. Oh gosh. Hmm. Lord it, help us. It depends which state and depends what you have been vaccinated with. And Vermont being 80 percent vaccinated and Alabama being what 20? Adds up to 100. There you go. <laughs> it's, it's it's a compliment. It's a compliment. It's complimentary, at least. No fact checking here, by the way. No. It could be the other way around. Vermont could be twenty percent, and Alabama could be eighty, for all we know, right? And who's to say? Well, the Who did say, and they <laughs> ended up smashing their guitars, and uh, they had th- them on one side, and then the Grateful Dead played, and then Jimi Hendrix. But wait, wait, wait. We're talking about Woodstock, right? No. <laughs> No. All right, you bet. You better take the lead here because I'm somewhere in Alabama, trying to get my COVID shot. I don't know if you you watch Stephen Colbert, but it's good to see the celebratoriness of you know him back in this in in studio with an audience. That's mighty exciting, you know. To you know, following those those people that have kind of maintained us through this thing, you know. I don't know if you happen to see when he did go live in front of his live I did. studio audience. Incredible. There was a, there was a virtual entity. It's amazing what you could do with with graphics, um, C- CGI. Um, John Stewart appeared and looked so much like like the real John Stewart. It was amazing. It was really exciting. I did see John Stewart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was he was. Um, um, speaking about you know the belief that uh covid came out of a lab and it was no 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 no, no. it was definitely no colbert came out of a lab no it wasn't covid (laughs) colbert it was a lab as in a labrador no what was it it was it was something about the wuhan uh laboratory and he was he was pointing out that the name of the laboratory was the same name Right as the virus, right. and I, I thought he was kind of animated when he well, said Well, you know that. that Sanjay Gupta was on Colbert like the next day or a couple of days after, and then he was giving some you know weight to that idea as well. I thought that was really interesting because about I don't know four months or so ago that idea came out, or, or before maybe, and I I think Trump had had talked about that idea, and I think there was such a knee jerk reaction to anything that Trump says. The, who knows the, the the roots of all these different ideas? But like once Trump said, it, the, I, I remember reading the press like, no, no, that's ridiculous, and there was reactions like, N- no, ridiculous. And now it's all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but it's now becoming a legit question to ask. I find that really interesting. Well, by the way, who other than John Stewart allows people to think about things if someone on the right said it first? Mm, I don't know. Is there like a board of associates of think tank of something in Washington, D.C.? Could be. I do find it interesting. Somehow that the idea is not allowed to penetrate and then all of a sudden somehow it pops through and then now it's an okay question to ask, you know, or, or so. I thought David Brooks decided that. You know that what it reminded me of was was it David Brooks? I was you know during the Gulf War. I remember like for about three years, you know, not buying in, not believing it, being like so. I know you were on that camp too. Like this is total you know bullshit. And then all of a sudden the press, you know, say three years after, started saying, "Oh, this looks like this was." You know, the wool was pulled over our eyes, and oh, we shouldn't have done this. And it was like. Really, guys? <laughs> Just interesting how, you know, the truth, you know, whatever, I don't want to say the truth, say, but, you know, certain 
ideas are acceptable and then not acceptable. And I, and what makes me wonder, you know, speaking of philosophy, is like how much I am swayed by what I read in places and how much we have to strive to not be necessarily swayed. It's a battle, right? To be like, what find what is the what is the truth that we as we see it, you know? And and I I felt validated when that when in two thousand six I started seeing books written and the press started saying, oh, the the the, the war in Iraq was oh well, maybe that was not a good idea. Like yeah, a lot of us were saying that. But well, it wasn't. how do we raise our kids? I mean, we don't raise our kids to say to their teachers. Who are you trying to kid? Like, I reject that idea. That's not how – that's not a good way to get an A. That's not a good way to get into Columbia, whether that's Columbia University or Columbia School of uh, Window Washing, which is um, where I had applied to, but actually I got rejected. But but we're taught uh, – ex- excuse me. Wait a second. There's some animals here. I'm sorry. We're taught to follow – um, <laughs> ma, ma, uh, and do what's comfortable. I didn't mean it that way, but you know what I mean. Um, is it comfortable to believe that a bat started COVID? It's more comfortable to believe that that it was a bat, right? Than that nobody nobody's to blame, or or that it's you know not that nobody, but it's that, well, what, what's John Stewart the, the animated? John, um, <clears throat> was saying on this live Stephen Colbert episode was that um, he was fr- so coming from the heart saying, I'm so grateful, people. And of course, he says it in such an articulate way. <clears throat> he gets not only the words, but the order. Right. And he said, I'm so grateful for science and how science enabled us to work through using the scientific method to work through this horrible problem that science created. And then everybody mm. laughed. Mm-hmm. And, and I do notice this all the time. Actually, I was thinking about this um, <clears throat> regarding uh, uh, an interview I saw with Jerry Garcia recently where um, you laugh at the most dark things. It's, there's such a contrast between humor and the darkest elements of exploration into the psyche and to society. Mm. And you laugh. And you laugh. Yeah, I was thinking like Jerry Garcia is like right. he's being interviewed and he's like so funny and he's so frivolous and oh, yeah, 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 like Santa Claus and so jolly. And he's so sad and his music is so deeply sad. So speaking of darkness, uh I think you and I have read recently uh or fairly recently um, two books about the Armenian genocide. One is called The 40 Days of Musada by Franz Werfel, which is almost a 900-page novel. The other is called There Was and There Was Not by Meline Tomani. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I was really glad uh, that you suggested that we read this. I actually had it and I came across the 40 Days of Musa Dog. I mean, first of all, yes, 900 pages and no audio version of this book, which was hard for me. <laughs> so that, you know, hence it took me, took me some time. But I'm so glad you suggested this book because I got it when I was reading a story about the, the genocide, of, you know, the, of the Holocaust. And, it's, and, and, and in this book I was reading, it said the 40 Days of Musa Dog was the most important book you know, besides the Talmud, say, or the, 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 besides the, you know, the, the Bible. But in terms of like reading book that people were passing around the ghettos in, 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 you know, the, the Jewish ghettos during, during the Holocaust. 
and that this was the book, like in the Warsaw Ghetto, and this was the book. And so I was like, oh, I got to read that book, and I hadn't gotten to it. And you suggested it. I said, absolutely. And w I, this is the first book that I've read that I really felt like I was reading a book not just now, but I was reading it and experiencing it, uh, how people experienced it in a different era and what this must have meant to people in that time. It was, a, it was a, you know, it was the, this is the story being one of, of a, of a, of folks standing up to the Armenian genocide and trying to stand up to the, the, the Turks that were trying to annihilate them. And so Jews during the Holocaust found this book very inspiring. So I'm really glad we read it. I'm really glad. Plus, in, in light of what Biden's done recently, maybe you want to say something about that. Yeah, well, I, I think it's been very difficult for politicians around the world, the United States included, to acknowledge what happened in 1915 and 16, you know, that, that time frame. It's sort of the end of the Ottoman Empire um, when there were well over a million Armenians rounded up and um, taken mm. from their homes and marched off into this, I think it was the Syrian desert. Right. Uh, put where on they boats were and killed, sunk in the water. Yeah, put in boats and sunk in the in, yeah. you know, out in sea just, and just like, just massacred, utterly, uh, essentially. Utterly. And uh, I think it's been difficult politically for, let's just use an example you said, Mr. Biden, um, for a president or the head of state to acknowledge this because Turkey is such a world power today and the, the uh, Turkey doesn't want to hear about it. And right. that leads us to the other book that uh, we both uh, over the years have read, um, There Was and There Was Not. And, yeah. and the way I – I'm so glad that you know we're discussing both books because – I see the first book, The 40 Days of Musada, as kind of metaphorically, it's sort of like if you picture in the ocean, there's like some deep in the earth, below the ocean, there's an earthquake. And that causes this rupture and movement of millions of tons of earth. Of course, it's below the um, water. And that causes a huge tidal wave. And that tidal wave spreads out across the oceans and has dramatic effects on low-lying areas around the world. And I, I see that the 40 day, this, this Armenian genocide was such a shock wave. And Meline's book, There Was and There Was Not, is sort of generations later across the sea looking and exploring not so much from a mean like i hate turks or anything like that not at all um it's her exploration about the effects that these tidal waves have had over generations and 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 the effect it had on her growing up as this right. armenian from new jersey um right. and she's like yeah i'm a jew so it's like i was brought up I'm not going to say indoctrinated, but um, in a good way, maybe indoctrinated. I mean, just brought up deeply uh, enmeshed all around me information and feelings about what happened to my relatives. Um, it wasn't right. some distant thing, the Holocaust for me. It was my family. Right. Um, right. And right. I, I'm alive because my grandma and my grandma, they, they had the good sense to get out of Europe at very young age. You know, they, right. they were in New York and New Jersey at a very, you know, age 18. They just left oh, everybody. God. Oh, my God. And and so, you know, Meline's exploration is the, the, the two books go in tandem. One right. is the shockwave and the other is picking up the pieces and, and, and are, are you whole? Are you... Okay, I, I've been indoctrinated. I'm taking her point of view now. Like everything is about the Armenian genocide when she's growing up, and and it's like too much, and she's rebelling against it. It's like right. to some extent, and she goes to Turkey, 
and wants to see what the Turks are like. And they're so hospitable. They're like, welcome. And, you know, they're part of their religion and their culture is always to welcome the other. And she found it to be beautiful and troubling at the same time. So I highly recommend both books and both studies about these extremities in human nature. I want to just say that uh, 40 Days of Musadag, Musadag, which means Mount Moses, uh, or or something like that, um, is a phenomenal book. Um, Franz Werfel and the translation by James Riedel, which is phenomenal phenomenal as well. Um, It's a really incredible read. And I, I feel... Um, I don't know, I feel kind of some, it's a poignant read because I think a lot of people have forgotten this book. And it makes me sad because it's this epic read in the 1930s. And it's still a really good book, not that it shouldn't be, you know, these, you know, 90, 80 years later. Um, It's an incredible read. It's really intriguing and it's so well written. I mean, I have my book is full of things I marked of just that the, the, his use of language and 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 the, the, trying to show the depth and the and the and the tragedy of what was happening is just like uh, incredible, uh, you know. And the way he describes, I'm just I like uh, choosing a place at random because I have so many markings in here. But this is the beginning of this chapter called the Interlude of the Gods. It says those Homeric heroes battle at the Skyian Gate. And each believes victory or defeat is settled by his weapons. Their heroic struggle, struggle, however, is but a reflection of the struggle which the shouting gods conduct above their heads in determining human fate. And even the gods do not know that their struggle in turn only mirrors the struggle long decided in the breast of the Most High from which springs peace and strife. You know, so he, and he'll just throw a little thing in that and then go on with the story. You know, and uh, just just astounding use of language, and uh, I, I would you know love to. I wish there was an audio book of this. Maybe maybe you or I will have to do it <laughs> if we could get permission. Uh, uh, maybe yeah. we should. Maybe we should. <clears throat> and uh, the, the, here's I, th- another I think that's brief. A great project, actually. Right. Here's another brief. Here's an, just another brief. It says speaking. So the main character of the Forty Days of Musa Dog is Gabriel Bagradian, who is um, not a true character. The, the story is a real story, by the way. You know, this has actually happened. It took, it was about 53 days, and, and he narrowed, the author narrowed it down to 40 days, which is kind of a biblical, obviously, idea of the 40 days. Just this little, look at this sentence. It says, no man knows himself until he is tested. And then he goes on to talk about Gabriel trying to figure out, he's the leader of the group that takes everyone. Basically, they they they, they decide uh, this doesn't give anything away. There, there is some surprises in the book that I don't want to give away. But like, they are, they decide we can either leave our village and go this way, or we can leave our village and go up the mountain and try to just defend ourselves. Because if we're on that high point, maybe we'll have some, you know, have, uh, you know, some advantage over the Turks who are trying to kill us. So, th- th- so five thousand people from the surrounding villages go up the mountain. This is a true story. And survive up there for fifty, you know, for forty days. As the story is forty days up there, and um, and Gabriel Bagradian is the one who leads them, and he's the kind of and so. But there's a lot of intrigue, right, in the book itself, right, between of the the, the his wife and him, and the uh, the character, the different characters, and uh, boy, what a what a read! It's what really a, read. a study of not only how to push up against death and how to deal with death on a large yes. scale, but it's also about how to live. And because it is. it's really a story about a society coming together under harsh conditions. And I just found that the author dealt with the traumas so tenderly uh, without going into a lot of detail, particularly about Gabriel's son, um, right. who, oh, who I thought was oh. central to the story. It's the oh. story of love. This, oh. this is a story of love and forgiveness. And I do have to, uh, if if we're if we're still on that that uh, everlasting tangent of philosophy, I do have to raise the question, probably without answering it, of if we were able to bring into our podcast discussion right now 
Mohandas Gandhi, what he would say about the idea of these Armenians arming themselves, defending themselves, and essentially using violence to try to eke out a few more days of existence. Hmm. That's a good question. Don't know if there's an answer. You know, I know what they did, and I know what they guaranteed their... I know the method they chose guaranteed their survival. It's... What would Gandhi say? What would Gandhi say? Right. And what's what what does your... I, and I'm not referring to you, Eric, but yep. what does your religion say? What is your morality uh, about when there is a bully... And the bully means business. Right. Um, there's this wonderful song that I'd love to discuss later about um, nobody dies from a broken heart or a broken mm. wing or something. Yeah, yeah. But this is, mm -hmm. this is not a broken heart or broken wing. Correct. This is, this is a full-blown massacre and these yep. people mean business they're trying to destroy millions of people yep and they're good at it and they're efficient and they know what they're doing and they're doing it and it's systematic does this have the support of all the people in turkey of course not but it had enough support and people were well were all the Germans all up for killing the Jews? The answer is no. Uh, were enough of them? Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> very unfortunate, uh, our species. I, I don't pin this story on Turks. I pin it on our species and our propensity. I made a joke earlier in the podcast about... Um, what percentage of a certain type of male would say, would read George Orwell's 1984 and say, yeah, that's okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Bring it on. Yeah, that's us. And it's a type of fascism. It's a type of acceptance deep down of a very, very steep hierarchy and destruction not just control, but destruction of those who are lower down in the hierarchy. That seems right. to be embedded not only in our past, but in our current, it's now 2021, I believe it's mid-June, um, in our current society in the United States. Um, it's prevalent. We're right on the edge of it. You know, you were saying earlier again in the podcast, Eric, gosh, we're coming out of this COVID thing, you know, this, the birds are singing, everything's groovy. And I'm like, no, that's not how I feel. I feel like our society is once again facing this, this earthquake, this, this fascist steep hierarchy raising its ugly head and people nodding their heads and saying, yeah, that's okay with me. Right. Right. This is not a story of the past. And all this 40 days of Musada, these earthquakes that bubble up, that ripple through the generations, there's so many of them. We're surrounded by them. It's not just something that happened in 1915. Correct. There are wars all around the country, and there's the Rwanda thing, and there's the thing that's happening with China, and, and, and North Korea's got its issues, and the, the Trumpists have their issues and it's these things are bubbling up and the the exciting thing is when it doesn't happen for 15 minutes right right i feel like this book uh was was uh uh franz werfel's attempt to make sure that this was not forgotten you know to re keep reminding us and i think that's what uh uh, and I think he was successful, uh, certainly, you know, in inspiring 
you know, Jews in Europe to try to, to fight on. Um, and, but it does at the same time, like I was saying before, there's a poignancy about like, yeah, yes, it keeps going on, but then things get forgotten. And like, I feel like this book is almost getting forgotten and the Armenian genocide. I'm glad that Biden made that declaration recently. Um, because it's hard to believe, but these things get forgotten. You know, these things that, that seem of the utmost uh, importance. And then people forget and we repeat this, <laughs> the same things. Why do they get forgotten? Maybe because, well, you know, they're what, they're the title of that book. You know, they're, 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 there was there and is, there was not. There was and there was not, right. You know, that I think partly people don't want to remember. People don't want to acknowledge um and and then also you know like many Jews came survived the Holocaust and then didn't talk about it it was too too awful and um so that's also part of it right I mean if the stories don't get told then people are ready to move on right and I don't remember studying too much about civics or morality um in my schooling. How important is voting? In other words, what is the what is the line that's holding back in our society not having a, a fascist system? It's getting enough people to vote. Um, how are we taught? How are young people taught in school that it's insanely important to vote? Most of the people I know, l- lovely lefties. New Ages in Vermont. Most people don't vote. They don't care. It's like, it doesn't mean anything, man. Like, peace, man. Like, whoa. Wow. Well. And that that opens the door for a steeply hierarchical, destructive, powerful movements to fill, fill that vacuum. How do Holocausts and... 40 days on mountaintops happen when good people sort of forget about it. Mm. Yeah, so Eric, you've come out recently with an amazing album, The Year of Seeing Clearly. Um, I have been listening to it, um, and I have just been so moved by it. And I was wondering if you have thoughts about what inspired you to create this masterpiece? Oh man, that's nice of you to say, and thank you for listening, Mark. I mean, I'm I'm uh, I'm really happy to have released this thing, this album, and uh, boy, I'll, you know, I will say a lot of it uh, came about because of the podcasting, I, you know, and and then these live streams I've been doing with my son Leo and. We've been playing the songs, and it's kind of forced. Basically, it's the first I've ever done this, where I just kind of force myself to like take a grain of a song and make it a real song, so I could sing it for the podcast. And I sang a number of these songs on the podcast over these episodes, and then and play them on the live stream. And now this album is a uh, is is a lot of that, a lot of those songs, and uh, and basically baking it all into an album and I'm super super pleased with it and uh the year's yeah. seen clearly I think this is the first uh, album I've done where I've uh I'm I'm the most almost mm, removed from it in terms of saying oh what it's about or what this song is about you know it's more of of the listener and me as well trying to g- g- glean meaning from the song and what is what is that what does even the title mean and and i don't mean to see, sound so aloof but that's how i feel it's like uh you know i i think i think the the t- album title uh was you know i think comes from you know the thought that 2020 vision you know is like when you can see really clearly and the year 2020 was maybe in some hearts was going to be that year you know where we could really and maybe we did see things clearly, I, I, even more clearly. In fact, I kind of think a lot of things we did see more clearly. But uh, anyway, so. That's I, a, I found mm-hmm. it to be such an incredible journey. I, I was 
I was I've been working on understanding the thread of the album, the sweep of it, the arc. And one of the things I feel is that there's this epic quality to the songs. You're sort of like looking at 30 from 35,000 feet up, um, the, um, son of the, the that song son is of it all. the son of, there's so many, you t- it's hard. You're not talking about just an individual. You're talking about a mythological presence Correct. And Correct. it's, it's Correct. big. It's big. It's the year of seeing. Clearly, you're not you're not sad, but you're sad and happy. It's just all these opposites, and the narrator is is introducing the listener to to the sweep of humanity. It's really quite powerful. Hmm. Yeah, that song. Uh, maybe that's one I I could sing. I um, I um, I wrote that all in one one pretty much one fell swoop. And uh, and uh, you know what does it mean? You know when I open with a song where you know is it I? Because I say I am, and and it's just I think poetically it's the most you know I I've, I've thought about Dylan and stuff and the way that you know Bob Dylan the way uh, that. When a when a singer says I am, it that can be interpreted in a lot of ways. I'm am, am I giving a speech? Am I saying this is exactly who I am? What I am, or does it mean different things? And 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 I I think like you're you're right. I I went definitely a bit mythological with it and historical and and I think the song kind of alludes to the nation, but it alludes to me and it alludes to people I know and friends I know and my family, but it also alludes to a whole bunch of things. I'm certainly not the son of slaves. And that's one of the first lines in the song. And it's, it's, uh, you know, what does that mean? Well, that's up to the listener to decide what that means for me singing that. And, you know, son of slaves, son of riches, uh, son of ditches, son of mills, all these different things. So I found I found there was this Whitman esque like Walt Whitman kind of feel to it. Is um, is, is thinking of uh, Leaves of Grass and um, great American poet um, he, he who would walk down the road and he would introduce all the layers of society, the, you know, the beggar and the, this and that. And I felt there's a, in several of the songs there's that kind of epic quality uh that that i could you know point to walt whitman if if i'm thinking of a literary character but then i but then one of the songs there's several of the songs that really surprised me um partly musically and partly the feel of it and i'm thinking of the song in particular uh about cutting wire and root mm-hmm Barbed wire, Route 134. Route 134, yeah. There's this kind of hard edge to that song, but there's this comfort. It's like, I, you know, I've seen you grow as a musician for, for quite a few years, and it's just like, you're so comfortable in your own skin in, in singing that song and performing it. It's insane. And there's this edge to you that I really like. Um, I mean, there's there's sort of a lot of different Eric Marings as that that I'm perceiving you as an artist, and and one is a very kind of empath, Eric, and you know feeling other people's pain, um, and you know oh gosh, you know you're you're having a hard time, you know there's a hardness, a tough, but but you know nothing, um, broken heart, no that never killed anybody. So that's one of the songs. Um, But, but this particular song about the barbed cutting barbed wire on route uh, one 34, one 34 is um, there's this tough loose. It's, it's almost like Bobby Weir when he was younger or Janis Joplin, when she's singing me and Bobby McGee, there's this kind of this road quality. And I'm just sort of picturing Dorothy Lang and the, the great depression out West going down the highway and you see like people are tan and hungry and there's this burnt quality to things. And you're just like, you're just there driving this. I don't know. Uh, it's just this hard rambling 
like a chain gang feel to it, but very Americana, very natural. And I have to admit, uh, I'm very, I'm very drawn to that energy. Um, mm. and, and it was, but it wasn't contrived. It was very natural. Um, and you know, I'd like Bobby Weir, look out. Can I sing that one for you? <laughs> it would be right? my honor. Okay. So, yeah, I, I can I could say where certain songs come from, but I think it's more it's more where I'm at to just let people hear and and interpret. So. Cutting barbed wire, listening to the dead. Who got the watches? Who got the time instead? Concerned that the bridge is a little bit burned, and there's nothing we have learned. I wish I could take away all the pain. Wish I could sing and make it rain Wish I could know when I can't I wish I could know how to see the plan Wished I had a way to talk to him Tell him I'm sorry that it got so grim the forces are fiery and fierce to a fault And the tired old wound was calling for salt Man, can the news tear us apart? Who can lay a claim to a brain and heart? The confused will always refuse And the chickens will always come home I finally think I understand why you drank No one to pray to, nobody you could shank Lost your son just before the war Nothing you could thank anyone for Do we think we can be here by being half here? Always sorely faking and mistaken, my dear. It's like an earthquake is taking a break, and we're waking from the baking of the bread with the storm. Is something brewing in our head? I wanna run, 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 run till I'm blue. I want to walk, walk, walk and talk, talk, talk to you I've had fights with my friends But we made up in the end We all have a part in it falling apart You can shine it and show it and call it art but can you measure the blather on the net Or the treasure of the laureate I want to propose a toast to those we love the most To those we hold so dear Year after year past who loved without fear year after year <laughs> epic thank you so much for that wow uh, so this thanks. is eric Maring, the year of seeing clearly. 
Special, very special. Wow, thank That's you. Just thanks, blows man. me away. Thanks, thanks, and I'll put up a link to the to the record. You can listen to it on any streaming platform: iTunes, Apple Music, whatever it is, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you want. Well, I can so. only say, keep going. You know, keep keep, keep putting it out. <laughs> I think that's the lesson in this for me. You know, is is to keep writing, keep going. You know, it's easy to 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 fall into, oh, you know, a cynical viewpoint or to stop believing in yourself as an artist. It's really easy to happen. So I say this to any artists, you know, any songwriters, anyone painting or writing poetry or writing books or anything. It's really easy to dismiss your ideas. And I think the lesson that I that I keep reminding myself, I keep learning over and over is no. Keep your ideas, take your ideas, write them down, uh, keep working on them. They may not be, they may not seem like something at first, but if you bring love to them and care or whatever it is you want to bring to them and just work them and work them and work them you know then then bring it to the world and uh and it you know it, you know it can be for can be for one it can be five it can be for a hundred or it can be for a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand you know that doesn't none of those numbers alter what the art is at its heart and that art is you know your your expression and what it does for the people around you, you know, to see you being expressive and expressing your art, however you do it. It's a must. It's a must. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's such a powerful song. And the way you sing that in, and the, the, the feeling that that generates is just incredible. So, you know, keep, keep going. And, uh, you know, it's just brilliant solo. It's brilliant when you pull in Greg Healan. It's brilliant when you in Leo and Steve Fox yeah, Steve on drums Fox. and the, the whole crew. You just Dan this, Griffin on bass and, yeah. and Julian. I, yeah, I was happy Julian. to say both my sons did a, had a big part in the album. You know, in terms of solos and and, and uh, you know keys and organ and saxophone solos, incredible and violin and viola and harmonies and yes and greg we got um on son of it all which was a real treat him and leo singing together was their was voices epic, just right? compliment epic. your beautiful epic. voice and and uh epic. you could just imagine all these artists just waiting to have like five hundred thousand likes and just sitting there staring at the screen waiting waiting to be adored and recognized on CNN or something like that. And then when it happens, so, so okay, like. You, you, that doesn't alter the art at all. The art is still there. Maybe you know, it's, it's still easier to, you know, get laid or something. I don't know. <laughs> Do you know that actually Mr. Peach is he, he does a lot with barbed wire? Um yeah, it's not, it's it's interesting cuz he doesn't use the same materials. It's but it's still barbed wire. It's made out of it's made out of a I don't know. A, it's like a mesh. A mesh. Is it a mesh or is it a mush? I don't know with Mr. Peach I can never tell. He, he uses yeah, it's a peach mush. He uses it. He strings it up along the uh, along the road, and it and it says, "Come right through." <laughs> it says, "Welcome. Go home. Do not enter." <laughs> I love you. Hey, I love you. Go, go get out of here. I'll shoot you. So I mean, it sort of <laughs> lets the reader decide. You know, welcome. You know, I I was about to say something, but it's just over the edge, so I won't say that. <laughs> Oh, I was ready for it. I think I think it's kind of like the peach um, peach pies. You know, if you put a pinch of peach pies along the border of your property, the 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 trespasser has the option of stepping right into the pie, or stepping over it, or carrying it away. You know, so he kind of his barbed wire is more of a kind of like you interpret what you'd like to do with this barrier right here. You can. You do, when you say it. barrier, do you mean bury her or bury? <laughs> Her or barrier. I you have to interpret what I meant, and then you go from there, and then you speak based on what you think I meant or what you interpret I meant, and that's kind of the fun of all conversation. Words don't exactly have the meaning you think they do, nor does this idea. I could be saying 
idea as in a deer's eyes, or it could be saying I, idea as in like I, you know, so you have to figure that out. Go. Or how about an ID with an ear? <laughs> exactly. Like id, <laughs> id, your sense of self and your ear. Oh dear. Or it could be your ear of living clearly. <laughs> Do you ever think of that? That like it's 2020, and you can yeah. hear clearly. So it could be the ear of hearing clearly, or right. Beverly exactly. clearly used to hear clearly. <laughs> or well, she did that in Beverly Hills, I think. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. So I, I, yeah. I mean, to me, it kind of comes back to the question that that you may or may not have raised, and that is, if you have a peach pie. Yes. Which, you know, can be enticing. And you have it surrounded by mesh barbed wire with Sharpies yes. on it. Sharpies, yes. It's a little bit like getting into a romantic relationship, isn't it? Hmm. So I have to interpret what you mean. And I'm going to think, let me see, is it is it the sweetness of the peach? Is it the gooeyness? Is it the crumbly part of the pie? Hmm. I don't know. Carry on. Carry on. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. Because if you take the next logical uh, step from being in a relationship, you would be discussing carry on, not carry on luggage. <laughs> carry on <laughs> like, luggage. That's what I was thinking. You like meant. carry <laughs> on away with sun. I'm just, I'm just saying that. It's not just the words we use. It's the order that we put them in. That's Correct. just as important. Well, me take ride <laughs> a four. What? What? You, you, you were in the Boer War? <laughs> what are you talking about? And, what did, and, and don't talk to me about the Trojan War either because oh, I'm God. done with the Trojans. I'm just, that's it. I'm done. Four ride me take. Yeah, I understand. Four uh, season suite. We we right. went covered that. Yeah, keep going. A ride for me take. I sound like Yoda. That's master to you. <laughs> Do you realize that Mark Hamill has liked two of my tweets? Wow. So don't say that I've got no you know, force left. I've got it just a little bit left. And then somebody told me that Star Wars was fiction. Oh what? my god! Ah. May the horse be with you. I don't know. I think the power of belief is so important that I've stopped believing in it. <laughs>